Chapter Eleven of Mary, a fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by April Gonzalez. Chapter Eleven. When I mentioned the three ladies, I said they were fashionable women, and it was all the praise. As a faithful historian, I could bestow on them. The only thing in which they were consistent. I forgot to mention that they were all of one family. A mother, her daughter, and niece. The daughter was sent by a physician to avoid a northerly winter. The mother, her niece, and nephew accompanied her. They were people of rank, but unfortunately, though of an ancient family, the title had descended to a very remote branch, a branch they took care to be intimate with, and servilely copied the countess's heirs. Their minds were shackled with a set of notions concerning propriety, the fitness of things for the world's eye, trammels which always hamper weak people. What will the world say? What will the world say was the first thing they were thought of, when they intended doing anything that they had not done before? Or what were the countess doing such an occasion? And when this question was answered, the right or wrong was discovered without the trouble of their having any idea of the matter in their own heads. With the same countess was a fine planet, and the satellites observed a most harmonic dance around her. After this account, it is scarcely necessary to add that their minds received very little cultivation. They were thought French, Italian, and Spanish. English was a vulgar tongue. And what did you learn? Hamlet will tell you. Words. Words. But let me forget that these called Italian songs in a true gusto, without having any seed sown in their understanding. All the affections of the heart such a work. They were brought out of the nursery, all the place they were secluded in, to prevent the faces being common, like blazing stars, to captivate lords. They were pretty, and hurrying from one party of pleasure to another, occasioned a disorder which required change of air. The mother, if we accept her being near twenty years older, was she the same creature, and these additional years only served to make her more tenaciously adhere to her habits of folly and desire to stupid gravity, some trivial points of ceremony, as a matter of the last importance, of which she was a competent judge, from having lived in a fashionable world so long, that well to which the ignorant look up as we do to the sun. It appears to me that every creature has some notion, or rather relish, of the sublime, which is in a consequent state, that a sublime of weak minds, these images fill, nigh, a tubic with their nourished souls. One afternoon, when they had engaged to spend together, Anne was so ill that Mary was obliged to send an apology for not attending the tea table. The apology brought them on a carpet, and the mother, with a look of solemn importance, turned to the sick man, whose name was Henry, and said, The people of the first fashion are frequently places of this kind, intimate with they know not who. Yet I do not choose that my daughter, whose family is respectable, should be intimate with any one she would blush to know elsewhere. It is only of that account, for I never suffer her to be with any one but in my company, added she, sitting more erect, and as my little complacency dressed her countenance. I have got concerning these strangers, and find that the one who has the most dignity in her manners is really a woman of fortune. Lord, mamma, how ill she dresses! Mamma went on. She is a romantic creature. You must not copy her, miss. Yet she is an heiress of a large fortune, in Shire, of which you may remember to have heard the countess speak the night you had, of the dancing dress that was so much admired. But she is married. She then told in the whole story as she heard it from her maid, her pick it out of Mary's servant. She is a foolish creature, and this friend that she pays as much attention to as if she was a lady of quality is a beggar. Well, how strange, cried the girls. She is, however, a charming creature, said her nephew. Henry sighed, and strode across the room once or twice, then took up his violin, and played the air which first struck Mary. He had often heard her praise it. The music was uncommonly melodious. Anne came stealing with the senses like a sweet south, and the well-known sounds reached Mary as she sat by her friend. She listened without knowing that she did and shed tears almost without being conscious of it. Anne soon fell asleep, as he had taken an opiate. Mary, then brooding over her fears, began to imagine she had deceived herself. Anne was still very ill, 
Hope had beguiled many heavy hours, yet she was displeased with herself for admitting this welcome guest. As she woke up her mind to such a degree of anxiety, that she determined, once more, to seek medical aid. No sooner did she determine, than she ran down with a discomposed look, to inquire the ladies who she should send for. When she entered the room she could not articulate her fears. It appeared like pronouncing Anne's sentence at death. Her faltering tongue dropped some broken words, and she remained silent. The ladies wondered that a person of her sense should be so little mistress of herself, and began to administer some complex comfort, as that it was our duty to submit to the will of heaven, and the like like consolations, which Mary did not answer. But waving her hand with an air of impatience, she exclaimed, I cannot live without her. I have no other friend. If I lose her, what a desert will the world be to me? No other friend, re-echoed they. Have you not a husband? Mary shrunk back, and was alternately pale and red. A delicate sense of propriety prevented her replying, and recalled the bewildered reason. Assuming, in consequence of her recollection, a more composed manner, she made the intended inquiry, and left her room. Henry's eyes followed her, while the females were freely and inadverted on her strange behaviour. End of chapter 11